Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic issues uh, in the state of Hawaii. And uh, this afternoon, I'd like to talk about um, traffic issues that pertain to businesses in the uh, Central Business District of uh, Honolulu. Um, what we hope to find is not only how we look at the problems of traffic, but also try to identify solutions. And with me this afternoon is Paris Chai. She's our business owner. She's my guest co-host. Welcome, Paris. Thank you for coming. Aloha, Tim. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to discuss our Hawaii uh, traffic issues with you from my experience as being a resident of Hawaii. Well, you have a lot of experiences because you grew up here and okay. you work downtown as an attorney, I believe. I'll let you kind of introduce yourself, but um, by all means, please introduce yourself and the fact that you grew up here and how you've experienced traffic um, as the years went by. Okay, well, um, I was born and raised in Hawaii and I grew up in Hawaii Kai, but I attended preschool and um, elementary school in Kahala. So it's, my experience with traffic started even before I could drive a car and my mom would take uh, me and, um, and my brother and to school every morning from Hawaii Kai and we would take them not the the straightest route like from point A to point B to school we would do this circuitous route through all the side streets of Hawaii Kai just to avoid traffic and then we would finally hit Kalani and Olu Highway be sitting in traffic and get to school. So, so was there traffic even when you were a kid, was there traffic issues? Even when I was a kid, there were traffic okay. issues, and it seemed to get worse as um, more communities and um, uh, districts within Hawaii Kai um, uh, came about mm -hmm. through just construction of new homes. And then I uh, attended the University of Hawaii, and so by then I was driving. And so I thought, okay, now how am I going to handle this traffic situation, getting, getting to my first class at 8.30. So I would pick up my, my best friend, but then I also had to pick up somebody else um, who became a friend so we could just uh, use the carpool lane in order to try and go a little faster. So you befriended someone just so you can get that third person in the car? Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I knew him a little. It was acquaintance, but okay. I gave him. But we became better <laughs> friends while sitting in, in uh, less traffic going to the carpool lane okay. to the University of Hawaii. Um, uh, I did befriend him. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then after that, uh, I um, escaped the Hawaii traffic for three years. I went to law school in California. And then when I came home, I was employed as a law clerk um, for the judiciary, so I worked for the state. And you know, I, had to get to, I had to get to court on time. And to get to court on time, I kind of relived my youth and I would take a very roundabout way to get to the courthouse. I would go from Hawaii Kai through Waikiki and down Alamoana just to get to the court to avoid the traffic on H1. Um, That's a lot of miles out of the way. Yes, it was, it yeah. was, but um, I learned all the back roads. Uh, and there, were, there was also traffic on the back roads too, so I had to be at work um, by 7.45 working for the state. Thereafter, I uh, was a prosecutor, so I worked for the city. And the city also starts work at 7.45. So um, again, I uh, did securities routes, but at this time I had moved to Kailua. And one of the reasons why I moved to Kailua is because on the windward side, there's alternative routes mm -hmm. besides Kalani Anaoli to get into the downtown proper region. Um, and I found that to be um, better, better flowing. Um, however, um, I had to be at work from uh, at 7.45 again to be a prosecutor. Um, my next job was a lobbyist. I was a lobbyist for Verizon. And we too started at 7.45. And Verizon is one of the... Um, or the utility companies are some of the larger uh, private employers. Um, so um, I would um, sit in traffic and turn on the radio or my CD. So and before you had a, a court date or you know you had to be there, I mean, how often were you stressed out? I mean, did this impact your, your ability to perform your job? Were you stressed out? Or did you just figure out a way that you, didn't, you weren't stuck in traffic all that much? Well, I actually, um, I was stressed out. Mm -hmm. um, 
because when you start your day um, um, trying to get to work on time and you, know, you either have to leave earlier or um, even better. Um, Verizon was uh, pretty flexible with me because I was a lobbyist. I was able to adjust my schedule and not have to get to um, be there at 745 because I worked to about um, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock each night. Mm -hmm. So when I would uh, get to work about 830, I found the traffic congestion to be less. Um, less than um, being at work at 745. So I think flexibility in work schedules um, would certainly help um, our populace in Hawaii and so far as getting to work. And We're to talk a little bit about that later on here. Okay, and to, re and to reduce the stress. I mean, we know that stress is not a good thing. And a, a healthy em um, employee is one who has less stress and can come to work happy and just ready, ready to go. And I think that's... Um, uh, of what every employer would like from their employee is productivity and also being being happy. So now... Um, Not an easy thing to obtain. I mean, it really isn't. I mean, having your, expecting your employees that, you know, are coming from EVA or, or from wherever, you know, and it's an hour and a half, you know, bumper to bumper, and then you arrive at work and arrive at work at happy, that's, you know, that's, that's tough. And, you know, my whole, my whole, my objective is, you know, how can you preserve aloha when the aloha is being crushed out of you waiting for an hour and a half in one direction every morning of the day, except for the weekends. And that's, that's difficult. And that's why traffic, <coughs> I think, impairs us to a point where you don't always see it. It just slowly works at us, at us on a subconscious level. And we don't even realize the true impact of, of traffic because uh, we just, you know, we grit our teeth and we bear it and we try to get through it each and every day. But it does have an effect. I agree absolutely with you, Tim. So my current job, actually it's um, from 13 years ago, I'm a, I have my own real estate company. I'm a principal broker of Hawaii Navy Realty. And as a realtor, I can, um, I have a very flexible schedule. Um, I work my work hours, um, or coordinate my work hours um, around my clients' mm -hmm. um, time schedule, but I can also schedule meetings when it's not um, in the heat of traffic, either right. in the morning or in the afternoon. So that has relieved a lot of stress in my life. But I do find that, again, traffic does affect um, the pricing of real estate. For instance, the real estate on the west side of the island is um, less expensive than, say, um, real estate in um, closer to town or on the windward side again, where um, there's uh, three dif different uh, routes, H3, mm -hmm. Mikiliki Highway, and the Pali Highway to get into downtown. So, you know, traffic has a very um, expansive, far-reaching um, effect on our lives. Well, that's, it, you know, it's true. And, and when we talk about transportation, it's, you know, it's a very generic term. And, you know, the old, the old saying that a picture tells a thousand words is very true because I could talk about bus and I could talk about biking and, you know, those are words. So um, I brought some pictures here for our show today and um, we're going to show a couple of those right now and, and give a visual on what, what the impact is. And the first picture is basically 200 cars, or excuse me, 200 people and then 177 cars. And you can see by the, by the picture that it's the entire roadway is, is blocked. It's bumper to bumper. So if everyone did not drive their own car, what would that look like? So the next frame is those same number of people in those same cars, but look at the spatial difference. And uh, you know, it's a dramatic difference. So each car basically is blocking and basically taking up the capacity of the physical road space. So the next picture is what would those 200 people look like if they are on bike? And as you can see, they're all down the, the center lane and you see more road capacity uh, available for other vehicles. Uh, it'd be nice if they were all van pools or transit bus or what, you know, or things like that or carpools, but um, generally it's single, ve single occupancy vehicles. And the next frame is what would uh, people look like on three buses and that's the capacity um, visual on that and the last but not least my favorite frame what would people look like on a light rail train and you can see how much how much space availability there is but um, as you well know Paris that uh, the newspaper is never sh never void of articles about light rail here in 
in Hawaii, uh, particularly the cost overruns, um, the viability of it, the visual asp aspects of it. Um, there's controversy that's plagued almost every front page news article, you know, be it weekly or bi-monthly, whatever. And the question is, you know, is, is that last visual that we just saw, is that worth the price uh, that we're all going to pay for, uh, for light rail? Um, again, my background transportation, so there's a part of me that says light rail is, is part of the silver buckshot to, to our, our traffic solutions, but um, it depends on how it's implemented. Well, my opinion on that has actually changed over the years. Um, I've been very fortunate because I've had the opportunity to travel to other uh, countries and cities that do actually have um, a rail system, and I think it's fantastic. And I um, respect Hawaii's um, leaders and planners insofar as trying to make Hawaii um, such a place with um, an option for rail. Um, however, I do think personally that um, the route could have been better. I would like to have seen the rail go to the airport um, downtown, um, Al Moana and Waikiki, or near Waikiki vicinity. Um, of course, we don't want to ruin this, our skyline. Um, and the University of Hawaii. Yeah. You know, we want to promote education. We want our rail system to actually um, be effective and be, be helpful. And uh, so my opinion has actually uh, metamorphosized over mm -hmm. the years into something different. And I um, still am optimistic and hopeful that um, you know, we, will, we will accomplish our goals and the people of Hawaii um, uh, traffic congestion will be relieved um, with this um, added um, opportunity yeah. to um, that's motor a, That's an optimistic viewpoint, and I hope that your uh, optimism it prevails. I, um, you know, I'm sure most voters didn't envision Middle Street as being the final destination. And um, as you re recently, I believe the light rail was announced that it's now gone from 8.5 to 9.5 billion dollars um, because there's financing involved right. and financing costs money. So. Therefore, the, the cost of light rail to be implemented is, has gone up um, from the 5.4 billion uh, initially conceived. So um, I'm glad you mentioned downtown and light rail downtown because, you know, that probably is not going to come straight downtown, but uh, hopefully as close as possible. Uh -huh. We have 4,000 units going on in Kaka'ako, uh, 4,000 condominium units. You work downtown, um, Kaka'ako is a little bit you know, further out by the airport, but I can't imagine 4,000 units going online and the traffic getting <laughs> substantially better than what it is right now, because right now it's a challenge to get in and out to the airport if you're going Ala Moana, then Nimitz. Um, it's a challenge, and what do you think? What do you think's really important about the 4,000 units and, and traffic congestion? I think that um, the key to um are one of the keys to relieving uh, this traffic congestion during the interim of the rail being built is for our community to step up the plate and to work together. And um, what I suggest is that these either private or public, whether it's the city or the state or you know large companies, private companies, even small companies, to really think out of the box and be more flexible in their, their scheduling of um, what time an employee has to be at work. And of course, you know, we have computers and we can work from home. And um, I think employers and employees should explore those options. And um, what, what's your feeling? Well, I'm going to get right to that as soon okay, as we, great. we're going to go to a commercial break. And uh, Paris, thank you very much for your perspectives. And we're going to talk more about that. So this is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella with Paris Chai, and we'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Justine Spiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. Every Thursday at 4 p.m. on ThinkTech, we host the Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. We like to bring in folks from the whole realm of the local food supply and agriculture, anyone working on these issues, any organization or individual that has plans or projects. What kind of people have we had on? Uh, so we've had farmers, we've had chefs, we've had people from government, uh, larger institutions, everyone who's working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. 
So you can see us every Thursday and join the conversation on Twitter, and we hope to see you there. Think Tech Hawaii, Asia in Review. I am Johnson Choi, the host. Looking forward to see you next month, December 15, Thursday, 11, right here at this channel. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella, and we're here talking with Paris Chai about traffic congestion in the downtown central business core. And uh, we're going to also talk about uh, solutions and specifically what employers can bring to the table as far as traffic solutions. So, Paris, thank you. Welcome back. Thank um, you. I would like, you, you had mentioned before the break about what employers can do or employers need to come to the table as well as with their employees. And I couldn't agree with you more because I think that's one of the things that's lacking uh, here is a lot of employer outreach. If you look at the commute peak hour congestion hours, you know, basically 7 to 10 mm -hmm. or 6 to 9, um, you have people from all over this island going to one place, and that's usually in the Waikiki or Central Business Corps District. And why are, they, why are we all on the road at the same time? Well, we're trying to get to work. So if, if work is the destination, um, maybe those that are the workplaces, or i.e. the employers, um, maybe it's time to, to tap them gently on the shoulder and say, you know, what, what can we all do and, and, and provide solutions since everyone is trying to get to your workplace? And I just don't think the state or the city is really doing all that much uh, in consideration of having employers come to the table as part of the solution. I come from a state where there was actually a law that mandated employers um, be part of the solution. I definitely don't think Hawaii is ready for that. Um, what state was that, Tim? Washington State, mm -hmm. and particularly the Seattle Puget Sound areas where, you know, the majority of major employers, um, you know, were, were located. And, you know, there was a law passed back in 1994 that was called the Washington State Commute Trip Reduction Law that basically put the, uh, a mandate on employers that employed over 100 employees that came to the work site between 6 and 9 in the morning that were full-time. And that law dictated a few things. And again, I don't think, uh, I don't think Hawaii is ready for a, 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 a legislative mandate, but I do think there should be some tax incentives for employers. I think there should be some grant dollars that we could um, come up with, and maybe there already is, but it's not a, very much of it. And so there's things employers can do, which I'm gonna kind of talk about. Is, um, the first thing is, an employer can just simply appoint one person at the work site who would basically be the point person for transportation questions or traffic questions. Um, they're called an employer transportation coordinator. Their name is posted, and their phone number is posted, and their email is posted throughout the work site, and it's simply have, have traffic questions or you have tr um, you know, questions about our transportation program, call so-and-so. You know, and so that's, that's real easy. And then the second thing. I like thing, that. That's yeah, a great just, idea. It's a point person. That's I all wish it I is. I had that. It, it costs nothing. It really costs the employer nothing to have someone is just, and it's not very, going mean, to require very much time of someone's day. Well, you could just add this to somebody's job description or just use somebody in HR. Right. And usually, it's funny you say HR because usually that's where it comes out of. Because transportation benefits is just that, it's a benefit. So uh, employers are finding out that um, transportation benefits is actually really valuable because it's a daily reminder that the employee is using something the employer gave them each and every day, whereas you know a lot of other HR benefits we forget about. We forget about, well, we don't forget about a health care or a dental plan, but we, f we forget about all the other stuff that employers provide for employees. Mm -hmm. I think this would be just a real great win-win. It is a win. Um, uh, opportunity for both the employer and the employee. So can you tell me more? I'm, I'm oh, intrigued. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's, it's an employer providing things that really maybe doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, if there's a, a, a room somewhere in the employment site where bicyclists can come and, and park their bike, they're worried about security, they're worried about locking the bike outside, you know, a building, maybe the employer would say, go ahead and bring your bike inside and we'll put, you know, we'll dedicate this room for you to put your bike in. Some employers have shower facilities. I mean, how great would that be for bicyclists to use an employer's shower facilities and lockers and, you know, encourage bicycling. So that doesn't cost a lot That'd of money. That'd be fantastic. And that's, you know, great for your health as well. 
Oh yeah, I mean, we, and, live, we live in and, Hawaii. Well, you know? and, and you know, we look at most most health plans. They're trying to proactively address health, not reactively, because we all know the premiums go up exponentially higher when you're reactive to health issues versus proactively trying to change diet and encourage exercise and things like that. So, you know, it's a win-win, as you said before, for employees and employers. Um, the things that do cost money, and you know, um, you start off slow as an employer. Let's say I just came up with $15 that I'm gonna give each and every employee that decides they're gonna um, come in by bus or a van pool, or even incentivize them for um, um, walking or biking or even carpool to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some players say, well, you have to do it, you know, five days a week. Well, that's, that's not really realistic because everyone has days where they have to go to the doctor after work or, you know, they have appointments. But it's, you know, start off slow. Say, you know, if you can come to work three times a week but by any of those modes, we're going we're gonna to help subsidize the cost of your bus pass or your van pool fare or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about um, uh, other entities um, subsidizing um, this as well, or maybe even the employee. I don't know if that was that an option in in Seattle or well, in Washington. Well, we would. Well, we would. We, we would do is. Um, you know, when I was working with Boeing or Microsoft or all the major employers, I would encourage employers to you know offer subsidies for their employees. But what I would do is I would come to the table with some federal grant dollars and say, look, <clears throat> let's have a private public partnership. And if you give your employee $10, I'll match that $10 for one year, dollar for dollar. But not to go down the corporate welfare um, you know, mm -hmm. road. Then the next year, the second year, I'm now going to provide 66% of that same subsidy. And then the third year, I back it off to, 30 th to one third. And then on the fourth year, the combination of the employer's $10 and my $10 now is $20 given to the employee, and they're on their own. So it's a, basically a four-year or a, th a full three-year partnership, and then on the fourth year, the employer now owns that subsidy for that employee. But what they find is that, you know, employees really value the fact that they're getting something to help them come into work, mm -hmm. and it's really valued. So that's, that's how we encouraged it, was by um, entering to the discussion as a partner, not just someone who implemented a state law. Uh -huh. I'd rather be someone who is a solution provider rather than, uh, implementing the law. You don't want to be a dictator. Uh, well, that's <laughs> no, we don't. And but it doesn't work. It doesn't right. work. And so you found this to be successful, where um, both the private and um, the public and the employees um, were were willing participants in Seattle. Well, not at first. <laughs> like any um, legal mandate, um, there was a lot of resistance. But over time, they realized that look, the city. The cities that were, you know, also mandated to follow the exact same law, they weren't exempt. The state wasn't exempt. The federal agencies mm -hmm. weren't exempt. If you were an employer in Washington State, regardless of, of, of non-government or government, you had to comply with the same mandates. And so, um, you know, people just said, this is one more regulatory act that we have to contend with, and we're not happy about it. But the difference between what we did versus what California tried to do in the early 90s was that there were staff paid staff to be part of that assistance. Not only to explain the law, but also explain how we're going to provide assistance so that you can obtain your goals. Uh -huh, so you can achieve, you know, some ride sh effective ride share statistics at your work site and not just have us come in and say, you did or did not do what you should have done. Mm -hmm. So this is not, um, I don't, there's no federal program, but this is basically a, a state um, option. Um, yeah. Would you consider it, be, it to be more state and private and city um, or well the, the the law actually came out of the federal clean air act and oh, that was did. washington state's ad way to address um, some very very strict mandates from the feds about air quality so rather than you know shut down or 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 or, or hamper um, businesses they said well what's the other side of the equation for air quality well that's co2 emissions from the automobile well let's address reducing the number of automobiles in you know during these peak hours of of not only congestion, traffic congestion, but air quality issues. So that's how it kind of started in the legislature in, in Washington State. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and by then, it grew. So it took many years for, for businesses to feel comfortable about you know, what they did or what they were or weren't doing about addressing this law. So we would gently kind of guide them back into compliance. We never used a heavy, I don't think we ever fined anyone in all the years that I was working in that area 
uh, to an employer. Some came close. Mm -hmm. um, most of them were feds. <laughs> they just didn't want to deal with it. But right. um, it took time and it took credibility and trust. And uh, over the years, um, it became part of the culture for a lot of these organizations. Now, car dealerships said, no, we're in the business of selling single occupancy vehicles. We're not so happy that we want to participate in this law. But right. they did it. They did it as well. Uh-huh. Well, I'm kind of a free-spirited person, and I, I don't like anything to be forced upon me. So I like um, the, uh, the opportunity to have options. So There's lots of options. It's, and I'm going to talk great. about a couple more. Um, you know, what else can an employer do? You've already said it. Alternative work schedule is so important. If I can, you know, take a day off a week by working 10 hours a, a you know, 10 hours a day, four days a week, there's my 40 hours, mm -hmm. and take that Friday or that Monday off. If um, you could do a 980 work week, where you work, uh, you take one day off every two weeks, you work nine hour days, um, that helps that one day of, of, of where I don't have to drive in right. to the workplace. I think one of the most cost effective and simple things to do is just flex hours. If, you know, I a, agree absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if I can give a 15-minute a window or a 30-minute window in the morning and the evening to allow people to, um, you know, or maybe even one hour, sometimes it's harder. A lot of employers have actually now have two-hour windows, mm -hmm. um, both on the AM and the PM side of things. And if I could just adjust my work schedule and work later, just look at all the traffic that we're, we're basically spreading out. The only problem about... Um, um, flex hours is that, let's say, we have a van pool or car pools that have formed in our neighborhood that are going to the same work site. If I now am shifting my hours away from my carpool folks or my van pool, mm -hmm. then we don't have enough people to form that van pool. That's so it's true. a little bit, you know, works a little bit against that. I think that an another factor that we didn't raise in this conversation is um, children going to school. So parents, you know, they may have a flexible work schedule, but their children might not. So I think that we should also bring in um, the Department of Education and um, people from really private suggestion. schools really great to idea. come to the table as yep. well and to talk about it. So we can work together, employers, uh, you know, government, you know, federal, state, city. They're on the road at the same time. And, and um, yeah, they're on the road at the same time. And school officials. Yeah. Right. So that's one thing that we also were trying to do is work with um, basically the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. And I know that the University of Hawaii, Manoa, has a program. And the more that could be um, done with that, because that's a lot of traffic. We all notice the difference when school's not in session. But um, we're running out of time, and I'm okay. sorry that we just barely scratched the surface. This happens every week. Uh, I want to say thank you very much, Paris, for joining us. And it was, I appreciate your perspectives, and you really helped the conversation. Thank you. I enjoyed my time, and um, good luck, Tim. And You're need good, it. Well, I think, I think Hawaii's ready. You know, yeah. we're, we're, uh, sometimes we don't like to change, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good time yeah, to time. entertain our new ideas. Thank you thank very you much. Very appreciate very much. much. I'm Tim Apicella, Moving Hawaii Forward. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.